The 10th edition of Warhammer 40k is upon us, and the next major story development is the 4th Tyrannic War. The new edition sees High Fleet Leviathan encroaching further into the galaxy in the largest Tyranid invasion in known history in a flashy new trailer starring the Ultramarines. It's no secret that the Ultramarines are always the star of anything 40k related due to being the favorite child of Games Workshop. Everywhere you look, Ultramarines, Ultramarines, Ultramarines. In today's video, I'd like to talk straight to the new players coming into this edition, or maybe that guy starting a small army on the side. I'd like to try to sell you on some more obscure chapters that I feel like would greatly appreciate a little time in the spotlight. Maybe by the time this video ends, you'll say, you know what, I'll do one of these guys instead of being the 9 millionth Ultramarine player. As 10th edition focuses on the 4th Tyrannic War, there are four major Tyranid conflicts I'll be focusing on today. The three other Tyrannic Wars, and the Octarius War from the more recent developments. Each chapter listed will have some sort of significance or contribution to at least one of these Tyranid invasions. I'll also go about showing you a fast and easy method for speed painting each chapter that even an Ultramarines player can do. Keep in mind that this script was written in April of 2023, so if there's some new development about one of these chapters dying a horrible, painful death when 10th edition comes out, just remember that. I'd, I'd blame it on the lag or something. These servers suck. And finally, I may take more than a few jabs at the Ultramarines here and there throughout this video, and it may give you the impression that I actually hate the Ultramarines. So let me clarify before we start. I do. The site is a kind of complex, sophisticated subject when you really dive into it, and there's a bit to cover, so let's go right into it. The size of the Emperor, no, not the size of the Emperor, the sides of the Emperor, are a Codex-compliant Ultramarine successor who are notable veterans of the Second Tyrannic War. The sides were initially an Ultramarines company in the Horus Heresy, assigned to babysit an ancient device known as the Pharos. The company was later formed into its own chapter by the time the legions came to be broken up by Gulliman. During the time of the Second Tyrannic War, they were known to be the first responders to many Tyranid invasions in the Ultima Segmentum, making effective use of small squads utilizing hit-and-run tactics. However, their homeworld, Sotha, was overrun entirely by High Fleet Kraken, with devastating losses to the sides and their only allies in that battle, the Lamenters, and their signature, comedically awful bad luck. Even worse, after nearly being obliterated, the chapter went into reclusion after many of its members were afflicted by gene stealer parasites, although with psychic collars they managed to resist being overtaken entirely. The sides never truly recovered from these tragedies until the Ultima founding where they received Primaris reinforcements. However, the last of their firstborn were lost while escorting Belisarius' call to the Pharos, meaning that the new Primaris had in essence simply adopted the chapter name, as anyone who remembered their home world had been tragically served upon a silver plate thanks to fucking call. Of course, there's no mechanical restriction in accordance with that canon, but some people, you know, they, they might like that part of the lore, you know, whatever, you got options. The sides of the Emperor sport a very recognizable color scheme black limbs with a yellow torso and backpack area. This makes it very strange when I think of my friend, the only size of the Emperor player I've ever seen. The second-hand size that I bought from him back in 8th edition had not one mini painted correctly, even with the color scheme readily available on Google. Like, he didn't even accidentally do Marines Malevolent. He just, I don't know, custom chapter, whatever. Common sense would dictate that the mini being predominantly black would mean you start with a black primer. However, with the difficulty of painting yellow in general, I found that starting from white really helps get every tiny bit of vibrancy you needed to make a good yellow. Plus, it's easier to paint black over white as opposed to yellow over black. To make for an easier time painting both colors, I chose to work with a light gray on the torso, and then highlight both black and white areas with a white, or like a pale tan dry brush. From here, you have highlights on both colors established at once, meaning you can just tint the white into a yellow, and wash the white on the black parts down with a like a heavier wash or maybe like a contrast. From there you just do a very light wash on the yellow to re-establish some of those shadows. Now I know that they make transfers in 3D printed pauldrons for this chapter, but bear with me here. This is easy free handing and anyone can do this. First you make an X, then you make some little scythe bits, and you're done. Really, like it's probably not going to get simpler than that today. Overall, working with it as a black and white model until you tint it yellow makes for a really 
like fast and efficient way to paint up these little space marine nuggets like i'm a very slow painter in my opinion but even i can tell you this is fast and this is easy <laughs> Get them before they get you. Another quality home game from Butler Brothers. Now here's an obscure fucking chapter. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of the Death Strike. Put your hands down, liars. No one knows who Death Strike is. Actually, I had written this part of the script before Luis uh, from Rogue Hobbies made her video about the Rainbow Warriors where she mentions Death Strike. And I thought that was kind of weird because after I wrote this part of the script a couple weeks later, the only other person in history who knows who the Death Strike is mentions death strike so i don't know it just it's just kind of weird but anyways the death strike are imperial fist successors from the world of nihilus and perfect if you still like to play blue marines little is known about these marines although they are codex compliant and distinguished contestants in the feast of blades if you don't know what the feast of blades is imagine your grandfather had like 50 kids and he all wanted you to stay friends in 10,000 years grandpappy deems that you all reconvene every 100 years and duel each other to the death well, non-lethally, usually. You could say that Grandpappy is crazy and senile, but the kids are probably just as crazy because they said okay and they keep doing it. The Death Strike's propensity of jumping into danger with their bros like boozed out frat boys jumping into swimming pools translates to their involvement in the Third Tyrannic War, where they cooperated with the Flame Falcons and the Iron Hands in strategic planet nuking missions. These exterminate Exterminatuses? Exterminati? Multiple Exterminatus missions were an early attempt to slow down the encroaching High Fleet Leviathan in what was known as the Cleansing of the Ulic Sector. The Death Strike were also pivotal in the assault on Fort Moros against Chaos Forces, coming to the rescue of overwhelmed Elysian drop troops and notable veterans of the Verdon Wars, where they ended it by nuking the planet. Finally, if the pattern of nuke and rescue hadn't already been obvious, they deployed three companies to assist Imperial forces in the defense of Cadia in the 13th Black Crusade. Granted, Cadia did explode afterwards, and yes, it wasn't the Death Strike's fault this time, I'd still be careful about calling them to help from anything ranging to an alien infestation to changing a light bulb. The Death Strike have a pretty simple color scheme in general, dark blue with small variations to their codex marking on the armor, but notably the Death Strike have an interesting chapter symbol, being like this little wing lightning bolt thing. Now you're probably not going to find transfers or STLs for these guys and their symbol anywhere unless you make them yourself, but I'm here to help you with some more free handing advice. The badge is yellow on dark blue, so mix a blue and gray together to make the initial sketch on your blue and when you have it where you want it, go over it with either your yellow or a white that you tint yellow. I chose the tinting method because my yellow paint is from the bowels of hell and I hate it. Whichever way you want to do it, these guys are easy to paint, they look great, and are perfect if you like that ride or die kind of loyal stupidity. They're not actually stupid or anything, it's just funnier in my head. Wait a minute, exorcists? Aren't these guys known for fighting chaos? While you may be correct, the exorcists are one of the earliest chapters to engage with the Tyranids, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. The exorcists are an extremely secretive chapter, their very genetic history sealed by the High Lords of Terra themselves. They are rumored to be sons of Dorn whose gene seed was experimented on to make marines who are more resistant to the corruption of chaos, but alas, nothing can be substantially proven. Another thing that can't be proven is the spicy rumor floating around that their battle brothers are fully initiated after being possessed by a chaos demon and having it expelled from them. While Imperial inquiries have been trying to prove this for years, both the fact that the exorcists keep an extra two scout companies and their initiates have an 80% fatality rate definitely don't do them any favors in looking any less suspicious. However, when the exorcists received Primaris reinforcements, their third company was replaced by Vanguard Primaris and merged into the remaining two scout companies. So I guess an 80% death rate looks better logistically across two companies rather than three? So this is a list of marines that fight Tyranids. These guys live, breathe, and die fighting chaos. So why are they here? Well, 
The Exorcists are noted for their defense of the frontier world of Stonecrawl in the Ultimo Segmentum during the First Tyrannic War, chronologically making them one of the first chapters to ever fight Tyranids. Given that everything on this war simply focuses on Ultramarines and how cool they were fighting off Behemoth, I'd like to imagine Exorcists still helped off screen since, I mean, everyone gets sidelined when the Ultras show up. Plus, the Exorcists in general are more well known for their involvement in other notable conflicts, such as the Badab War, Third War of Armageddon, the 13th Black Crusade, and the Indominus Crusade. The Exorcists have a pretty straightforward color scheme like the Death Strike, although their backpack is a different color. The base coat I went with here is a simple mix of red and black in a 5 to 1 ratio. From there, the hard part is done. Everything else is the same dry brushing and washing I've done for all of these speed paints. I did notably cop out on the pauldron insignia on this one since I was working with a whole squad and, you know. I used this librarian pauldron that looked similar enough to their chapter symbol, although in my defense I know for a fact, 100%, you can find decals and pauldrons for these guys. I've seen them out there, so I don't want to hear any whining about this one in the comments, or I will find you and I will eat your fucking bones. All right, listen up. Requesting mortar support fire. Imagine this. You're a little chaos cultist in a fort on some backwater planet. It's a quiet day on guard duty. Your friend is heating up some human flesh rations as your eyes scan the horizon. You've looked over the same war-torn scenery for weeks now. There's nothing interesting out there as far as the eye can You, my dead cultist friend, have just been acquainted with The Black Guard, a Raven Guard successor chapter shrouded in mystery. They are known for their signature methodology slash sexual fetish, sieging the ever-living shit out of you and the square mile around you. These sons of Korax are kind of imperial fists-y in their methodology, and they're known for their liberal application of the Thunderfire Cannon to your forehead. For special occasions like birthdays and anniversaries, they like to break out the Fine China. And by Fine China, I mean the Vindicators. The Black Guard are masters of both careful ambush and indiscriminate annihilation, somehow utilizing the Raven Guard's secret sauce to deploy giant tanks and rapid fire turrets stealthily. They've also received Primaris reinforcements, making for a mix of Firstborn and Primaris like many other chapters. I imagine they have a surplus of Tech Marines as well, because, you know, someone has to supervise the Thunderfire cannons, right? The Black Guard are most famous for their defense of Doom Gorge in the Second Tyrannic War, where they repelled a planet's worth of Tyranids with only a single company thanks to, you guessed it, Thunderfire cannons. They are also known for their ill-fated joint defense on the Chromied Front in the Caradon Campaign. Together with the White Scars, they held off the Death Guard on Dryox Reach until their numbers overwhelmed them, and they were forced to retreat. And finally, their siege batteries were deployed to assist in the defense of Cadia, where I imagine some high-ranking Imperial Siege Master was very welcoming for the additional heavy artillery, volunteering to work simply for the fun of it. Although their name is the Black Guard, their power armor is predominantly white which means that starting from a white primer is the fastest way i found to start painting these guys. From there we'll go about it like that we did with the Scythe of the Emperors, dry brushing white onto a light gray and the dark gray and then washing the dark gray with a black wash to give you a little depth. From there it's pretty straightforward whether you choose to panel line the white armor with like a Tamiya panel liner or like a gray contrast paint a notable bit here is that I shaded my white armor with the new formulation of Citadel's Known Oil, which is much gentler on tinting surfaces than the old Known Oil. If you're still holding on to those old pots like me, you'll have to dilute it way more to prevent your white armor from turning black. Or, you know, just get a new pot. They're both good for different reasons, honestly. The red on the end is also pretty straightforward. We just need to be careful about not getting red on the white. Doing red at the very end also prevents getting that one molecule of red paint stuck in your brush. So when you go to white paint, all your highlights turn fucking pink. Not that I would speak from experience or anything. Starting with a red circle is also the way I would go freehanding this pauldron. After you get the red circle established, start with like a gray to sketch out the white lightning bolt, and then do the white on top of that gray. 
And finally, if you happen to take a shot for every time I said Thunderfire Cannon, consider this. Thunderfire Cannon, Thunderfire Cannon, Thunderfire Cannon, Thunderfire Cannon, Thunderfire Cannon, Thunderfire Cannon. But you can call me the Oracle. And don't worry about that vase. What vase? Oh, sorry, I didn't know it. Oh! The Atlantean Spears are a fairly new chapter in the setting. The Spears are Blood Angel successors, notable at a glance for being one of, like, two official Blood Angel successors that are not predominantly red, black, white, or gold, instead sporting a teal power armor with gold accents. They are functionally similar to Blood Angels, although they are noted to employ a mix of Firstborn, Primaris, and Vanguard Primaris. Even more notable is that they possess an unusually high amount of Librarians. With them, they take advantage of their foresight to preemptively respond to threats. One would think that the other Sons of Sanguinius would make great use of their Spears' foresights and counsel, yet the Atlantean Spears elect to focus almost all of their resources in fighting in the Segmentum Tempestus. In fact, when High Fleet Leviathan came to gobble up their homeworld of Baal, they chose not to respond since they had their hands busy. That doesn't really look good on your end, considering that the only other chapters to not respond were the Knights of Blood, who were declared traitors, and the Lamenters. See, it's always the fucking Lamenters, man. The funniest part is, is like, the Lamenters were gonna make this top five list, but I booted them for the Atlantean Spears. Like, I don't know, just, just a little unconscious meta humor there. But anyways, somewhere down the line they realized how bad that made them look to not reinforce at the devastation of Baal. So they elected to contribute heavily to the Indominus Crusade and the Argavon Crusades making notable contributions to fighting the Necron forces in Pariah Nexus. So why are the Spears on this list? Well, despite the name of Tyrannic Wars No. 1-3, there has recently been a major Tyranid war front in the Octarius War. See, there's this Inquisitor, Cryptman, who was there at the very first Tyranid battle on the planet Tyran, he named the things, he fought in all three wars. Basically, he managed to get his hands on some gene stealers in a stasis pod and thought, you know, if we deploy these in Orc territory, the Tyranids will go that way instead of into the Imperium. And to his credit, it did work. Temporarily. The Tyranids and Orcs warring in the Octarius sector backfired horribly on Krypton, with the Tyranids redirecting their attention back to the Imperium, hopped up on Orc steroids, and the Orcs all bigger from the recreational crumpin. Needless to say, this was a real gamer moment. Now, multiple Imperial forces are working to contain these juiced-up nids, which includes about a third of the Atlantean Spears. The Atlantean Spears are almost as simple to paint as a Space Marine can be. Whether you work on proper layering, speed painting, contrast paints, dry brushing, or ingressi, which is sadly known under that stupid meme name that I'm not gonna fucking say, you can't make me, Unlike every other Blood Angels painter though, you get to use teal, which is honestly pretty unique. I've only seen three Blood Angel chapters with a predominantly blue color scheme, that being the Atlantean Spears, the Red Wings, which don't even have a picture on Google, and the Angel's Lament. Oh, whoa, shameless self-plug. Oh, go watch my video. There's really not much to delve into here as the paint scheme is just really basic. Not even a bad way, it's just, it's basic. Even the chapter symbol is relatively easy freehanding for even the shakiest hands. It's like eight lines. You can do that. However, if I were to do an entire army of these guys, I'd still probably opt for dry brushing the standard guys and proper edge highlighting on HQs, mainly to save time and sanity. So that's five chapters that are both veterans of a previous Tyrannic War, or Octarius, and I feel are more interesting than the Ultramarines. Now, I'm not the painting police. If you want to paint and collect ultramarines, that's fine. Really. They've got a lot of history, they get a lot of spotlight, there's a lot of stories with them, and, you know, that's some. sometimes that's what people want. I get it. But when it comes to space marines in particular, I feel like there's a dance of extremes. You either see people painting the same old ultras, blood angels, fists, not the iron hands, space wolves, or on the other end of the spectrum, people making extensive lore, and custom paint jobs for their own homebrew chapter, like the Tua de Donnan. Ooh, second plug. Hey, I got a playlist. I feel like obscure chapters sit somewhere in the middle, with enough official material to have a basis to work off of, while also being ambiguous enough to add your own personal flair to it. Plus, you get like major fucking hipster cred. Imagine walking into a game store 
and smacking down your army and just being like, oh, <laughs> these guys? Yeah, they're the Death Strike. You probably never heard of them, but, <laughs> you know, of course you wouldn't. But at the end of the day, if you really want to collect Ultramarines, go ahead, man. Just have fun with it. That's what this hobby's about. It's about having fun and making fun of Space Wolf players. Oh, but watch out. Don't make them mad. They'll woof woof your yif woof woof. <laughs> Fucking stupid. So we're here at the end. Thanks for watching the video, guys. I really had a lot of fun delving into obscure chapter lore and history, and I'd love to do something like this again in the future, either centered on an event like the Tyrannic Wars or just some generally interesting side lore. I don't really spend my time reading 40k like official stories and whatnot, but like you know, I, I like I like learning about these these little smaller guys on the side. If that sounds like something you'd watch, be sure to let me know in the comments, and, you know, I guess you could subscribe if you really wanted. I also have a Kofi now if you feel like tipping to offset the price of these models. Contributions are appreciated, but never required. My content will always be free. Thanks again for watching, and have a good one.